Welcome to The Crime Beat. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein, and uh, we are rolling out something brand new here at WDIV, both on Click on Detroit and Local 4 Plus, where we're going to be putting out uh, bi-monthly interviews, deep diving, uh, iconic Detroit crime history. We're going to be getting with legendary members of law enforcement, legendary underworld figures, great uh, content producers, authors, investigators, experts. Um, we're going to run the gamut here, and I'm really excited about this first episode. We're going to um, drill down into the state of Michigan's most uh, iconic, most spoke about, most notorious unsolved mystery, the disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa, the Teamsters boss, who vanished from a Bloomfield Township parking lot in July 1975. And I'm very honored to welcome my first guest, retired FBI agent, Greg Stasekel. Greg, thank you for joining me. Hey, it's a pleasure, Scott. I always enjoy talking to you. You know, we're 48 years now removed. The case is, you know, steeped in, you know, Americana mythology, both local, national, international. Um, you know, just in general, what do you feel about the case now that we're 48 years removed? Nothing's really been solved. It's still a top of mind, I think, in terms of the media. Um, what, what's your feelings when you, as now being retired from the office for 15 years or so, uh, and you turn on the television, you still see people reporting on the Jimmy Hoffa case? What, how does that make you feel? Well, you know, it's, it's a funny thing because uh, that case sort of coincides with, uh, with my career in the Bureau. Uh, I got here in the summer of 75, and the disappearance took place in the summer of 75. So it literally, uh, in a lot of ways, shadowed my career. Uh, when I was working organized crime and when I was working surveillance, uh, that case was always sort of in the back of everybody's mind. And during my entire career, it was an open case where we were following leads. Uh, obviously, there was a lot more investigation initially into it. Um, I think that uh, we have, uh, when I say we, the Bureau and the Department of Justice, have a good idea of what happened and why. Uh, but as far as the specifics of uh, Hoffa uh, ostensibly being murdered, uh, I don't know that we'll ever know the specifics or, or what became of the body. We obviously have theories, uh, and as time goes on, uh, you know, uh, we may never know, though, exactly what happened. Does it, I mean, is it something that surprises you or, yeah, it kind of blows your mind that you can still turn on the national news almost 50 years later. Like I said, you've been out of the office more than a decade and they're still talking about it. They're still debating it. They're still digging. Is it something that you're just like, wow, uh, five decades later? And it's in some in some ways, it, it's just as um, relevant as it was when you started in the Bureau. Well, in some ways it is. And there, there were a lot of things that came out of it that, uh, I mean, it, it, it did change a lot of things. Um, and like I say, it followed me through my career. But still, uh, when people find out that I was an FBI agent and that I was in Detroit, especially at that point in time, that's one of the first questions they ask me. So what what happened to Jimmy Hoffa? Where is he? You know, and a lot of times it's you know it's you know is he is he really under the Meadowlands or you know under the Rensen or whatever. Um, so that part of it is there, um, but uh, I think a lot of times uh, people miss the the bigger picture of what happened with the Teamsters after that and what happened to uh, organized crime, specifically the Detroit family of the Lucosa Nostra. It was a real turning point, I think. I think for, it was, too. For the uh, union, for the mob, uh, for, the, for the Federal Bureau of Investigation, for the way that um, you know, federal criminal investigations are conducted. I agree. And, uh, you know, we threw a lot of resources at it over a long period of time. But, uh, you know, it, it was never resolved in the classic sense, but in a lot of ways it, uh, it uh, was resolved in a way that uh, I think uh, was beneficial. So Hoffa, everybody knows, uh, 
I'm assuming everybody knows Jimmy Hoffa was the president of the Teamsters, um, became almost a de facto head of state. I mean, in terms of his notoriety and um, the coverage, the media coverage on him, uh, he was as recognizable as the president of the United States or or a, like a leader of a, a foreign nation. He was uh, so prevalent on your n- daily newscasts, television, newspapers. Um, he had gone to prison in the late 1960s on a, a fraud and bribery case, came back to Detroit uh, on a uh, presidential commutation from the White House, got out early, comes back to Detroit and is insisting on reclaiming his post as Teamsters president. The mafia, specifically the mafia in Detroit, who had been his longtime benefactors and had been the uh, the Tokos really crime family who had been his entry point into the union and and his uh, meteoric rise through the ranks to become youngest uh, person, I think, ever on the joint council, youngest vice president, and then became president in 1957. He disappears July 30th, 1975, on his way to a lunch meeting with the Detroit Mafia street boss, Tony Giacalone, and the uh, a New Jersey Genovese crime family capo. Tony Provenzano. They're supposed to meet at 15 Mile and Telegraph, uh, at the old Red Fox restaurant. And Hoffa is seen in that parking lot getting into a car that was later identified as uh, Joey Giacalone's car, Tony Jack's son. And he's never, never seen again. And that car is the only piece of physical evidence ever recovered in the case. So let's just kind of start there. Um, and then we'll maybe go back a little bit and, and talk about you get into the bureau. Um, but what do you kind of remember about that? Those first, uh, well, first couple I, of days or weeks. I was uh, I was pretty much a brand new agent. I got here in late June of 1975, so it was like a month later after I had gotten here as a as a rookie agent coming out of Quantico, and uh, so this was a huge deal, and and for me, you know, a real eye opener in the sense that I, I don't think you could be involved in a bigger case than that. Um, all hands on deck, exactly. from Washington to Detroit. Uh, it's what they call a bureau special, and everybody, everybody that uh, that was in any way available was was called in because we knew we had a we had a short window of opportunity. Um, you know, Hoffa went missing on uh, July thirtieth. We got involved in the case not until July thirty first. Uh, the local police and uh, I think to some extent the state police were involved uh, the first day, but we came in and, uh, you know, we knew uh, we had guys that that worked, uh, you know, the labor uh, aspects, uh, the uh, criminal aspects of, of labor racketeering and organized crime. And those guys had a lot of sources and uh, they were the ones that were running the investigation. But we were out doing what we call a neighborhood investigation where we basically flooded the area. I can remember doing interviews. There's a, a strip mall uh, adjacent to still, the- Still there, the Bluefield yeah, Plaza. The, the Marcus Red Fox and- uh, Which is now on the end. Correct. And uh, uh, now Jimmy Hoffa would, never went into the Marcus Red Fox, never intended to go into the Marcus Red Fox. He, he, he believed that he was meeting with, uh, with Tony Jack alone. And it's more speculation than anything else about whether he was meeting Provisano or whether he thought he was going to meet Provisano. I believe that he had told some people that he was meeting with him, but- uh, they had his calendar, and on the calendar it said lunch meeting with Tony G, Tony P, and Lenny S. Lenny S being Lenny Schultz, uh, who was uh, Tony Jackaloni and the Detroit Mobs kind of uh, troubleshooter of the unions, and also owned uh, Tony Jack's headquarters, the South Athletic Club uh, off Evergreen. Right, and uh, and it was pretty obvious uh, after doing some of our investigation that uh, Tony Jackaloni, Anthony Jackaloni, was at the Southfield Athletic Club and making it very known 
that his presence was there. He usually was, you know, he, he wasn't that uh, social. But on that particular day, he was talking to people and making sure that he was very visible, uh, which would indicate he was trying to establish an alibi because he was not at, uh, at the Marcus Red Fox. Uh, we did believe that uh, Joey Giacalone's car was the car that picked Hoffa up. The 1975 Marquis? Yeah, Mercury Marquis, Marquis uh, maroon in color. Uh, yeah, it was a it was a dark, uh, yeah, dark, uh, a purple or maroon, uh, and th we ended up seizing that car at some point. And I believe it was the first week of August it was seized. And the f and that or car second week in August it was seized in August. I used to see that car in the uh, one of the bureau garages uh, on a regular basis. It sat there. I don't know where it is now, actually. Maybe the Smithsonian. But, uh, um, you know, since that time, uh, there's uh, other theories that have come up. Uh, that was the prevalent theory at the time and for a long period of time. But I suspect that, uh, and it's just a suspicion, that maybe that car was not the car. Well, I, 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 I've come to believe in some of my investigations that I think the car was involved, but I think there were multiple cars. I don't think there was one car. I think, uh, again, that's what, what, what do you, what's your take on that theory? Well, I, I think that uh, you may be right as far as multiple cars, and I'm wondering whether that car was even present. Uh, I'm wondering whether it was a car similar to that. The witnesses did not say it's, you know, it was a, a Mercury Marquis. Uh, I believe one or two of them described it as possibly a, a large Mercury or, or a Lincoln Continental. And, um, and uh, you know, they were similar looking. And, um, but uh, I, and there were other things. There was some physical evidence in the car that would indicate that Hoffa might have been in it. Uh, some hair follicles were found. They didn't find that till later, though, right? That's Before correct. They match it to a hairbrush. Uh... Yeah, that's what they used to match it with. Uh, hair is uh, is not the best thing to get DNA from. You can get DNA, but it's not as as good as some other things. And uh, uh, and then there was a uh, a very uh, uh, a very good dog handler. A uh, guy by the name of Chuck Art, who's, uh, and he, uh, his dog uh, put Hoffa in the trunk of the car. At least that's the way he interpreted it. Um, you know, and I knew Chuck, and, and he, he was excellent, but, it, you know, it's possible that, that that was not the case. And obviously, that's not admissible in court, even if it were. So, and just for, for people to have a more clear understanding, from an investigative point of view, why didn't the mafia want Jimmy Hoffa to return to the union? It seemed like they were very happy with him uh, in, in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, and then at some point in the 70s, they soured on him and wanted his replacement and his former right-hand man and vice president, Frank Fitzsimmons, who Hoffa viewed as a seat holder, a seat warmer for those years he was in prison. And I think that was what was initially agreed upon. But when he comes out of prison, Fitzsimmons is really comfortable in that president's chair, doesn't want to give it up, and the mob prefers Fitzsimmons. What was the reason you might have? Well, I think the primary reason was, I mean, he was Jimmy Hoffa's hand-picked successor. And, but Jimmy Hoffa, I think, always felt that when he was done doing his time, that he would get out and, and resume control of the union. And um, and Fitzsimmons did win an election while Jimmy was in jail. So he he had the position by his own right, having won the election. However, uh, Jimmy Hoffa remained extremely popular, well-known. And he was, uh, he the rank and file, uh, he was very effective as a president. He, uh, he had negotiated a universal deal with the trucking companies, a national universal deal, and, and it was good. And uh, he made the Teamsters one of the most powerful unions in the country, and if not the, the most, most powerful, powerful union in the world. And uh, yeah, and uh, so he was a very effective leader. Uh, Jimmy's relationship 
with the mob uh, was uh, symbiotic. I mean, uh, he he got benefit from it, and the mob got a benefit from it. Primarily, the ability to to have access to the Teamsters pension fund, um, which they used to build Las Vegas. Exactly, and uh, uh, but uh, when Jimmy went to jail and Fitzsimmons became head of the uh, Teamsters, he was much more uh, malleable for the uh, for the mob. Uh, he was willing to. Uh, Jimmy would push back, and he he ex- he he viewed it as as being uh, a, a thing among equals. Uh, Fitzsimmons was happy to be basically the lackey of the of the he mob. knew his place he in did. terms of what the, the mafia thought frank Fitzsimmons frank Fitzsimmons know knows where he is on the pecking order jimmy thinks he's higher than he actually is well and, and he uh you know he had his own idea how things were going to be done and and he wanted it you know like i say he wanted to have uh it, it uh, maybe uh, yeah a superior status if not equal um i think he felt by the time we're talking about here in the 70s, where he'd been in power since the 50s, I think he felt like he had outgrown some of the micromanagement and didn't want to be taking orders, per se, uh, at that point. And the mob was like, you'll take orders as long as we tell you to take orders. You're only in this position because of us. Um, and then I know, I, I, I want to uh, present this and get your take on it. I know that Mahoffa comes out of prison and like to your point, what you said, you know, he, he assumed that he was just going to walk right back into his old post. And when he found out that he was being blocked, he was very vocal with his displeasure and began making threats through interviews. I know there was one famous one on 60 Minutes um, where he was telling the mob, like, if you don't let me back in, I'm coming back anyway because I have the support from the rank and file. And when I get in, you're all being eliminated, which would then cut off the the, uh, access to the pension fund. I think that's all true. And I think, uh, in my estimation, uh, one particular event was probably uh, the catalyst for the decision that uh, he had to be eliminated. Are we talking about Nemo's? We are talking so about let's, Nemo's. So let's, that's the first. So this is about a month before Hoffa disappears. There is a car bombing attack at Nemo's, which still, which still is open on Michigan Avenue and uh, kind of walking distance or short drive distance from the Teamsters uh, 250, the, the local. Yeah, 250 was just uh, just across uh, uh, I-75 on Trumbull, uh, up the street from the old Tiger Stadium. And Nemo's is where a lot of the Teamster uh, brass and and just Teamster rank and file would go and drink. Correct. And, and you know after work. Uh, yeah. The, the the funny thing was it was uh, it was a watering hole for some of the agents in the Detroit Kyle. office because because the Detroit FBI office isn't that far away from from that's, Nemo's. That's either. right. I mean, there were times when I was in Nemo's and I'd be at one end of the bar and a bunch of the Teamsters would be at the other end of the bar and we'd be waving at each other, you know. But um, uh, so on, I think it was July tenth. Yeah. Uh, and keep in mind that uh, Jimmy disappeared on the 30th. 30th. But on July 10th, uh, Frank and his son Richard Fitzsimmons, and it was Richard Fitzsimmons' car, uh, they were inside Nemo's uh, having lunch, and uh, the car's parked outside, and it blows up. Uh, The indication was that this was not meant to kill them. It was meant to it meant as a shot across the bow, maybe. And uh, the speculation's always been that that was Jimmy Hoffa's way of saying, "Hey, I ain't going away, and I mean business." And, and, and that was kind of a um, a political struggle within the bigger political struggle of Hoffa trying to get back in as international president. The 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 kind of uh, beef in his hometown was over who was going to control two fifty. 
Right. Was it going to be his loyalists, Dave Johnston and Ralph Proctor and Otto Wendell and those guys, or was it going to be the Fitzsimmons camp, meaning Big Fitz, Frank Fitzsimmons' son, who they called Little Fitz, Richard. Um, and this was, like you said, this was Hoffa trying to, to, to make some statement that uh, he, he didn't if, – if you believe that the order for that car bombing came from Hoffa, it was some type of intimidation tactic to, to let, let them know, you might have the mob behind you, but I have some heavy artillery behind me too. I guess would be the best. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's one of those basic premises of, of uh, criminal investigation that there are no such thing as coincidences. Certainly there probably are, but in this particular case, I think it's, uh, it's fair to say that, that that was orchestrated, that bombing was orchestrated by Hoffa. Uh, and like I say, as, as a shot across the bow, hey, I'm, you know, this, I'm serious about this. Um, and uh, no one was hurt. The car was blown up. And, um, uh, and as you say, uh, the local that uh, is on Trumbull is, uh, was Hoffa's uh, base of operations. That's where he first uh, uh, be- began his rise, uh, became president of that local. And Fitzsimmons was also, that was his home local. So... That that became sort of the uh, the the center of gravity for uh, for the Teamsters and uh, all the liaison between the Detroit family, uh, the Lacosa Nostra, and the and the National uh, uh, Commission of of the fam uh, the families um, was was centered in Detroit and uh, Tony Jack alone was the primary liaison between the Teamsters and uh, the mafia. Uh, Jimmy Hoffa knew uh, Tony and his brother Billy or Vito Billy Jack, uh, the Jackalone brothers. He had known them, you know, in 1975 when he disappeared. He had known the Jackalones for 30 years at least, um, and had socialized with them, uh, vacation with them. I believe they shared some women uh, occasionally, and like you said, that was. The point man for La Cosa Nostra in Detroit in terms of dealing with all the, the labor uh, relations with the Teamsters was Tony Giacalone. Now, Tony Giacalone's go-between was Lenny Schultz, um, which explains why Lenny Schultz would have, in theory, been possibly at that meeting. And as you pointed out, the car bombing happens on July 10th, and then for the next three weeks, the contract on Jimmy Hoffa's head is fast tracked, I believe. And I, I agree 100% with what you said that it was something that was in the works, um, but hadn't yet had a full go or a, a full green light. And then once that car bombing attack happens, um, the powers that be, not just in Detroit, but I also believe in New York uh, and in Chicago, uh, are come to a consensus that this thing has got out of hand and Hoffa's murder has to be a top priority. And who are they going to give the contract to? In, in my research, and I want to get your opinion on this, in my research, the contract was given to the Detroit mob because Hoffa was an asset of the Detroit mob. And more specifically, it was given to Tony Giacalone to quarterback the conspiracy, plan it all out, and then have his underlings including his brother, most likely, carried out. I want to get your take on that because as the years have gone on, uh, I believe there is a a pretty heavy East Coast bias in the national narrative, which makes it seem like to a lot of people, and then we can can go into this in a little bit, but like with the movie The Irishman that came out, um, which dealt with this, uh, the, the, the Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, Martin Scorsese movie, it looks like all the planning and all the shot calling for the murder conspiracy was coming not from Detroit, was coming from New York, was coming from New Jersey. As a researcher and investigator, I've always pushed back on that. I, I'm interested in what your take is. As a, uh, I, I, tend to agree, I tend to agree with you. And the reason I say that, there, there's actually a couple of reasons. The source information, uh, what little we had, 
and uh, have gleaned over the years has indicated, first of all, uh, the primary liaison with Hoffa and the Teamsters and subsequently with Fitzsimmons and the Teamsters was the Detroit family. And interestingly, the bombing of Fitzsimmons' car, July 10th, July 26th, Vito and Tony Jackalone meet with Hoffa at his home on Lake Orion um, on July 26th, four days before Jimmy Hoffa disappears. We don't know what was discussed at that meeting, but uh, we do know that Jimmy Hoffa planned to meet again with Tony Jack alone, possibly Vito, and as you say, uh, Provenzano. Who and, should uh, let people know Tony Provenzano and Jimmy Hoffa at one point in time were very close friends. They were. Hoffa put Provenzano into power in the Teamsters Union. But when they were both in prison, they had got into a very bitter, bitter feud and had been threatening to kill each other uh, for about five years. And Hoffa knew in order to return to the union, he needed to get Tony Pro support. So I believe ostensibly the Jackalones came to him with the offer to broker a peace meeting with Provenzano, which would uh, pave the way for him to get back in the union. It was a ruse, in my opinion, but Hoffa was so obsessed with getting back in the union, he bought it. What is, what, how do you respond to that? Uh, I would tend to, to agree with you. And I think a lot of the agents that were involved in the investigation over the years would, uh, would also. There may be specifics that, uh, that we differ on, but, but I think that that was basically what happened. And, um, and Tony Giacalone and Tony Provenzano were related via marriage. Correct. Uh, Jack alone was Tony Jack was married to a niece of Tony Provenzano, I believe. Yeah, it gets confusing. Yeah. <laughs> but at any rate, um, uh, yeah, I would tend to agree with that. And obviously, uh, the Jack Alones and others had uh, uh, they uh, certainly Tony Jack alone had uh, uh, no intention. Of meeting with Hoffa, but Hoffa on July 30th. Obviously, whether he was convincing himself of something that wasn't true or he honestly believed it, he trusted Billy and Tony to, I guess, watch his back in this situation. Um, as we know, you know, it's cliche, but it's true, you know, but in the mob or in the mob, your killers don't come with ski masks. Your, your killers come as your friends, as people that you trust. That's right. And it's like the scene in The Godfather. Uh, you, you don't trust the guy that comes to you with the deal. And uh, that's basically what happened. Uh, uh, Tony, like I say, uh, had no intention, even though Jimmy Hoffa obviously thought that he was going to meet with uh, Tony Giacalone on July 30th in the parking lot outside the Marcus Red Fox. Somebody arrived, and Jimmy Hoffa got into that car voluntarily, at least based on what the eyewitnesses say. The car drove out of that parking lot, and at that point, uh, there are people that know what happened. Most of them are now dead, uh, but uh, and we may never know what happened after that. But we do know that, and we do know Interestingly, that when Jimmy Hoffa was waiting in the parking lot, he uh, went to a payphone, this predates cell phones, and uh, went to a payphone, called home, asked his wife uh, if Tony Jack alone had called. He, and she said no. And he said, well, he was supposed to meet me here. And uh, there's some confusion as to whether the meeting was supposed to be at 2 or 2.30. Uh, Jimmy thought it was two, apparently, and uh, but there, like I say, there's some confusion because the note says two thirty uh, that he left on his desk. But at any rate, the meeting did. I mean, the car did arrive sometime between two thirty and three, and uh, uh, based on the witness testimony, he got into the car and left. From your role as an FBI agent in in Detroit for two two and a half decades, and then you uh, moved to Ann Arbor, but 
being a Detroit FBI agent, what is it? Tell the audience who the Jack Oney brothers were. I mean, in terms of your work, these guys were, you know, the I, I call them the face of the franchise. It wasn't called the Jack Oney crime family. It was called the Toko Zerilli crime family because Toko and Zerilli were the founders and the leaders in, in the shadows. But the people that were out front and, and doing the day-to-day bidding was the Tony and Billy Jacqueline for yeah. like over a half century. Uh, you know, they were, they've been described as capos, but maybe a better description, at least more uh, uh, better describes their roles. They were street bosses uh, and they certain aspects of the family business they were in charge of. Uh, uh, um, and they played, they were, they were a good cop, bad cop tandem. Tony was the bad cop. Billy would be the good cop. Tony was the one who could kill you with a stare. Um, he enjoyed intimidating people. He enjoyed looking scary. Uh, and Billy was more of the good time Charlie, uh, meet you out for a drink, slap you on the back, you know, be your buddy. Now, mind you, both of them are suspects in dozens of brutal mob assassinations. And I've heard people... Um, Put the body total between the two of them at seventy five, fifty to seventy five bodies. Yeah, which I, is, I, I can't, I can't speculate on that. But you're, but you're absolutely right. And and their personalities were like you described. Uh, uh, Billy Jack tended to be the the gregarious guy, uh, uh, and uh, and Tony Jack alone was business. And uh, as you say, uh, and and uh, it, it's interesting when he created his his alibi on the 30th of July at the Southfield Athletic Club, uh, people said at the time it was odd because all of a sudden he was coming in and saying, hey, how you doing? And, and uh, making small talk and things. And they said he never did. That. He was stoic. He was not someone that wanted to engage exactly. with, with, so, the, with the regular patrons of the South Athletic Club. So, uh, which, you know, like I say, uh, Hoffa believed he was meeting. Tony Jack alone that day. Every indication was that that's what they had decided at that meeting, and, and maybe in subsequent telephone calls or whatever. But uh, but obviously Tony had no intention of being at that meeting, which leads you to believe that whoever was there, uh, they were the ones that picked up Hoffa and uh, and whatever. Uh, obviously, he at this point, I think we can safely conclude he was murdered, and then. The body was, uh, I believe, and a lot of a lot of agents believe that it was uh, destroyed as quickly as possible. I do too. And they had the means to do. Yeah, that. we'll get to that in in a second. Um, but Billy Jacaloni was unaccounted for that afternoon. He was the only um, ranking member of Detroit organized crime that was not being surveilled either by a FBI surveillance unit or a Michigan State Police surveillance unit at the time that Hoffa disappeared. Um, looking at uh, documents and records from the investigation, uh, Billy Jack had a, a normal tail on him, and he, he lost the tail at around 10, 30, 11 o'clock, and wasn't uh, picked back up until about six. So I know I believe that Billy was one of the people in the car that would have um, allotted for Hoffa to lower his guard because it would make sense if he was meeting with Tony Jackaloni that Billy Jack would come first and say, hey, Jimmy, my brother's up the street or my brother's at, you know, is, is at this place or that place and I'm, I'm going to be the one to take you there. Um, and I, I, can't, uh, I can't dispute that. Um, and it, it makes a lot of sense to me as well. Um, and... Uh, you know, it's it has. It, we early on had the theory, and it was in the Hoffex memo, which was nothing more than a summation of our investigation six months after the investigation began. That you know, uh, Chucky e. O'Brien picked him up in uh, Joy Jackalone's car. Uh, the Jackalone's car fit the description of the vehicle in the parking lot. There's a lot of questions that have developed over the years uh, some, related to Chucky e. O'Brien. Relating to whether Chuck O'Brien was even involved right. at all uh, in the in the uh, uh, in picking him up and and subsequently in the in the abduction murder, 
But, um, and, you know, I can only say that the timeline is very sketchy, and it would have been difficult uh, for, for Chucky e. O'Brien to have done that. And so, would they have trusted him? I mean, well, that's the other thing. And and Jack Goldsmith brings this up. Jack Goldsmith is now a professor at Harvard and has been was a White House attorney. And uh, Chucky steps or Chuck Chuck, Chucky O'Brien was uh, a Jack Jack Goldsmith's stepfather. That's correct. And uh, uh, Jack Goldsmith makes uh, some very strong, good arguments as to the fact that you know. Is that the guy you would pick, uh, you know, to do this? Um, he wasn't a made guy. Uh, and he was and, known as a blowhard and a liar and someone that wasn't very trustworthy. Well, and, uh, you know, he was uh, he, he had been very loyal to Hoffa. And, and the Jack uh, and the, For people that might not know, Chucky O'Brien was like a surrogate son of Jimmy Hoffa and the Jack Loney brothers. So his, he had some divided loyalties in this whole fallout. He did. And, uh, and they had had a bit of a falling out because he wanted a position in the union. That Hoffa didn't uh, want to give him. He didn't. And, uh, and uh, uh, something that Chucky, I- Chucky was, not, was not known for his intellect. He was known for his loyalty. He, he wasn't stupid, but by the same token, he was not the he was kind a go- of guy. He was a gopher, a driver. He wasn't someone that you, yeah. know, you would trust. Loyal with. and... Uh, and uh, uh, and dependable, but not necessarily a, a, a deep thinker. And, uh, you know, one of it, it's something that on its face looks incredibly likely. Chucky O'Brien is Jimmy Hoffa's surrogate son. He lived with him from the time he was a young boy. If you want to get Jimmy Hoffa to lower his guard, you know, you should send someone that he feels comfortable with, such as his son. But if you peel Beneath the veneer of everything being, you know, uh, Swiss Family Robinson, everybody's happy. You find out that, like you just pointed out, Hoffa and O'Brien were at odds at that point. They had not spoken, from what I understand, since 1974 when they had this falling out over a, 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 a Teamsters post that Chucky O'Brien wanted a promotion to that Hoffa had blocked. So I would go back at anybody that makes that argument about Chucky being there saying, well, if you wanted to lower his guard with the facts that we know surrounding their relationship, this does the opposite. This gets him mad. He would, if he saw Chucky O'Brien pull up in the car and said, hey, hey, Jimmy, get in the car, he'd be like, Who, why are you here? I don't want anything to do with you. We're not speaking. Yeah. And, but, but I don't think people know the backstory. They just know Chucky was a surrogate son and that Chucky had possession of that car during that day. I think that was intentional. I think the Jack Lonies wanted him to have possession of the car so they could point to him as... That may be true. And they may have, uh, uh, you know, uh, you could speculate. And there's uh, many uh, things that you can interpolate and determine that. uh, And But, uh, you know, having talked to Jack Goldsmith, and having talked to Jim Esposito and Bob Garrity, two of the guys that were uh, the original case agents on the uh, on the Hoffa disappearance, uh, they have all three come to the conclusion that uh, they don't believe Chucky e. O'Brien was the one that was driving the car or in the car that picked up uh, Hoffa. Uh, and that brings us to. If it wasn't Chucky O'Brien, who was it? And I know there was some theories that started to um, surface in the 90s uh, based on a a wire down on Eastern Market um, where they got a, at that point, a a crew boss in the Detroit mob by the name of Tony Palazzolo. They got him on a wire uh, acknowledging that he was involved in in the Hoffa case, in in the conspiracy. I don't know how much weight that got at the time, but then you fast forward into the 2010s and Tony Zerilli, who had been the underboss of the Detroit mob, uh, goes to the FBI and tries to help them solve the Hoffa case. And he names Palazzolo as the driver of the car and the guy that actually kills Hoffa. 
Jack Goldsmith in his book doesn't name Tony Palazzolo, but references him as in his investigation, the person that killed Hoffa was someone that was a low ranking member at the time that used his role in the Hoffa uh, conspiracy to leverage his career uh, forward in the mafia, became a capo and then eventually consigliere. He died in 2019. What, what do you take? Uh, uh, what's your take on the fact that some people believe that Tony Powell was was the either the shooter or the driver? And I'll also point out that if you took picture, if you took a picture of Chucky O'Brien in 1975, you put it next to a picture of Tony Palazzolo in 1975, they could be brothers. Well, and I spent a lot of time uh, following Palazzolo, as I did uh, uh, Billy and Tony Jack alone, and uh, it's certainly plausible. Uh, beyond that, I, I don't know that I can say more than that. Uh, and, you know, uh, having been involved in law enforcement and, and uh, having spent, you know, you follow the facts and, and there is some, obviously, some things that would, would lead you to that, but it would be pure speculation on my part. I, I believe, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe there was a early tip involving Palazzolo's family, but not necessarily Tony himself, because uh, Tony's family had ties into the... Um, La Cosa Nostra in Detroit for years before Tony came on the scene. And I believe there was a piece of property. I don't think it was ever um, dug up or or uh, searched, but I, I've been told by agents that uh, they had gotten... And that, that was when his name maybe first surfaced. But he's been someone that's kind of been in the background of this investigation that um, has kind of climbed... Well, he was... Uh, yeah, and he was certainly uh, a guy that was acting... He was, a, he was a downriver guy. He ran he was, the, the downriver region of, of Detroit. I remember how difficult it was to set up on his house. Um, but at any rate, uh, uh, he was he was definitely active in the family, um, and uh, and we did. Uh, he was one of the people that we spent considerable amount of time uh, surveilling. But again, uh, beyond that, tying him in, and and this was in the late seventies when I was on the surveillance. Course. And he was just at that point. He was a young up-and-coming soldier. He was not a shot caller in any way, shape, or form. But as the 80s and 90s come about, he, he gained a lot of stature. And I know that in Goldsmith's book, and, and according to some other people, some of that stature came from the fact that not just in Detroit, but in other families around the country, it was like this very top secret piece of information that only the people that needed to know knew but it helped Palazzolo. Um, it, it helped him in, in his in his with his mob resume. Um, can you talk a little bit about Palazzolo uh, in terms of um, personality? In terms of uh, you you uh, surveilling him? I know he had a reputation of being very elusive. He was, in fact, uh, his nickname at the time was the Butterfly, uh, and uh, he. Uh, a lot of these guys, uh, you, you had mentioned before that uh, that uh, Billy Jack had been, uh, maybe have been under surveillance at the, the day that Hoffa was uh, disappeared. Um, I don't know whether or not he was under surveillance, but I know having surveilled him, he was very adept at, at cleaning himself. Uh, he was not an easy guy to follow, and neither was Palazzolo. Uh, uh, and uh, that tested your skill level as a surveillance team to be able to do that. But um, beyond that, I, I can just say that we got a lot of information about his activities and stuff during that period of time, none of which that I can go into at this point. But uh, I can say that he was definitely... Uh, Heavily involved in the family business, and that was the late seventies. So, so, talk about the investigation as your career in the uh, in the FBI grows, and you become a veteran. Now you're no longer a rookie, but the case itself is still. A, I mean, it's still a top priority in 2023. I, I'm sure back in 1983, 1993, um, it was still something that um, was 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 a was a priority. So, kind of talk about as the years went on. What was it like working the investigation? Well, you know, I, I worked it only tangentially in the sense that, you know, there were leads to be covered and things like that. 
Um, I did go out to Ann Arbor in, uh, was 81 or 82, and, but I was still covering leads and, and what, uh, so, but I was not primarily involved in organized crime. Uh, but I continued to have contacts and, uh, you know, continued to be, uh, it, we all continued to be aware of the case. And, and for obvious reasons, I had an interest in it all the time and was in regular contact with the guys that were working on full time. We always had a, uh, at least one case agent that was involved. And um, it was pretty much uh, for that particular agent, it was a full time job you know, covering the leads and, and following up. Uh, and, you know, we constantly had what we call Title III coverage of different members of the family, uh, Title III being wiretaps and or microphones uh, that were uh, that we used during that period of time. So there was all kinds of intelligence and stuff coming in. But well, let, let's get to another very, very uh, high point of your career. And I, it dovetails with the Hoffa investigation. And I'm just going to play off what you just said. So as the years go on and there aren't any arrests in the Hoffa case, if you're working the top echelon of the Detroit mob, the Topo's really crime family, whether or not you're working those guys for Hoffa or not, they're suspects in the Hoffa case. So you might not have been working it directly, but you were working it indirectly. And... Um, Greg, in, in the summer of 1979, uh, gets kind of the, the tip or, or the, uh, you know, all the stars align. The, the FBI agent gods were shining brightly upon uh, Greg and, and his partners that day. Uh, I believe it was July 11th, 1979 or July 10th, 1979. And it was going to be a, they didn't know what, they didn't know what at the, at that time, but they eventually learned that the, event that they were able to surveil and, and snap photos of. And Greg snapped a, a historic photo um, of a Mafia Don inauguration. And uh, Jack Toko, whose father, Black Bill Toko, founded the Detroit mob in the 1930s, he was being tapped as the new godfather that summer of 79. He's also a suspect in Hoffa uh, as being kind of the the guy that the Jack Maloney brothers reported to. And just like, you know, uh, any group, when they, uh, when they uh, elect a leader, they have a ceremony and a party. And there, there was this party that you guys find out, found out about happening in Dexter, Michigan, at the Timberland Game Ranch. And you stumbled upon this historic event. You take a picture. It's... Yeah, people will be talking about Greg in Quantico and what he did that day in 1979 for forever because it was so unique. Talk about that day. And then in that picture, you have Jack Toko, you have Billy Jackaloni. Yeah, you know, I, again, I was, I was assigned to the surveillance squad. And I should probably explain that uh, Detroit was, uh, I think it was the first office that where we had a dedicated surveillance team. This is something that some other departments and stuff uh, did on a, on a regular basis. But Neil Welch, when he became the SAC in Detroit, the, the special agent in charge, Neil Welch uh, had been in uh, Albany, New York prior to that. And uh, during the uh, uh, the conclave, uh, the infamous conclave. Appalachia. In Appalachia in, in, in upper, upstate New York. And uh, at any rate, he, he uh, experimented with the idea of, of having a dedicated surveillance squad there. When he got to Detroit, uh, with an established family like the Detroit family, he decided that this would be the perfect place to, to set up this uh, dedicated surveillance squad. So we have what we call an off-site location where we would go. We didn't go into the office. We, we acquired cars that didn't look like police cars. And we learned uh, surveillance techniques and all kinds of other things. And without going into a lot of detail, I was assigned to that squad. And on that particular day, and I can't recall whether it was June 10th or 11th either, but uh, of 79, but... I think it was June... I think it, I said July before. It was June 10th, 1979. That I, I know that. <clears throat> that was. sounds right. Yeah. But 
uh, we were out, and it, it, it was just a what we thought was a routine day. We set up on uh, Quasarano's. Uh, Jimmy Quasarano was uh, Jack Tocco's consigliere, longtime member of the mafia, right out of central casting, the perfect hair, always dressed to the nines, uh, and, and, and worked out of Motor City Barber Supply. Yeah. He had like a wholesale barber supply place um, in uh, up in uh, Macomb County. In Roseville. Yeah. And uh, we sat up on that, and we had set up on there before, but on this particular day, we actually saw Jack Toko arrive and go inside. And uh, subsequent to that, uh, we see this van pull into the parking lot and uh, uh, Bomberito, a, uh, uh, Frank Bomberito, a, a, a made guy. Frankie the Bomb, who's Billy Jackaloni's right-hand man. Yeah. And uh, he, he goes in and then he, uh, subsequently he comes out and leaves in Jack Toko's car. Uh, then we see Quasarano, uh, Jack Toko, and I can't recall. Uh, there were one his or two. Brother, his, was his brother with him, Tony Toko? Uh, it's possible. I can't recall specifically. I'd have to look at my 302. But anyway, uh, they get into the van and they they get on the highway and start heading west. Now, we had another surveillance crew. When you have a crew, we'd have four or five cars, each, each car with just one agent in it. Um, uh, surveillances are a lot harder than they are on TV or in the movies uh, to do it right. At any rate, we're heading west, and I can hear the other surveillance crew, and I think they had uh, Vito Giacalone that they were following. And uh, they're, they're heading west, too. I can hear them on the radio. So uh, we're heading out. We have no clue where we're going. And we end up in Washtenaw County, which was unusual. Um, and then we end up on North Territorial Road, heading, continuing west. And uh, we get to this game farm, which was uh, north and west of Dexter and about due north of Chelsea, out, out in the, you know, in the, there's a couple lakes nearby and it's... Uh, Very secluded. It is. And uh, uh, this uh, game farm, and they drive in, it's private property, we can't follow them in. Uh, and uh, so we're able to set somebody up on the road. And... We go back to uh, about a mile away. We found a parking lot with a, a party store, and we're outside trying to figure out what the heck's going on. And uh, the guy that's uh, up watching the gate is calling out, and we're getting all these Lincolns and Continentals, I mean, uh, Lincolns and Cadillacs going into this game farm. And to some extent, we're identifying some of the people going in, but you know, we're thinking, "Wow, it's all the what? top! It's all the top guys, all the captains, all yep. the, the administration, and even some guys from from Canada, the other families, and some guys that were like emeritus uh, family members." And, uh, and we're going, you know, and uh, I, like I say, I had one crew, the Jack Alone crew, hooked up with us there. They ended up obviously at the game farm, and he went in. Um, and um, so I make the comment, we got to find out what the heck's going on here. This is, this is too big to, you know, uh, and I'm thinking about things like Appalachia and like uh, that. And uh, so I said, I, I'm going in. And uh, somebody said to me, well, you know, you should probably uh, call in and ask to make sure, you know, that's private property and stuff. I said, you know. That's going to take too long, and uh, it's easier to get uh, easier to get forgiveness and permission sometimes. So I just decided to uh, make a command decision. And there was, <laughs> there was another guy there, uh, Keith Cordes, uh, and Keith uh, Keith said, "If you're going in, I'm going in with you." And I said, "Fine." Uh, <laughs> so uh, one of the other agents drove us down to a road just west of. of the entrance, and we climbed a fence and went through the woods. And it was about, I don't know, a mile, mile and a half back to where uh, the game farm, where the area was. And we were getting close. We could hear them, but we couldn't see them. The, the woods were too thick. And we felt like if we got much closer, they would either hear or see us. And uh, I looked up ahead and I saw this open area, and it turned out to be an archery range. It was just 
cleared area for the big target at one end. So we came around and got behind the target, and uh, I had brought my camera with me with a big 300 millimeter lens. This is the old day. This was actually had film in it, and uh, so uh, we could see them in there. Couldn't we could hear them talking, but we couldn't hear what they were saying. And uh, I got up on top of the uh, uh, the target and snapped a couple of pictures. And uh, as luck would have it. The three people in the picture are Jack Toko, and then on one side is uh, is Billy uh, Vito Giacalone, and on the other side is Anthony the Bull Corrado. Both both uh, capos in the family, and uh, they're standing there, and they're obviously they're having drinks and stuff, and it, it you know it's a mob picnic. And um, I can't overemphasize to the people that are watching this how historic this is. Because other than a 1989 uh, mafia induction ceremony, which was recorded with audio, th this is the most unique image of a top secret ceremony being conducted by a secret society. Uh, I, I, I just I can't get over the the unique how unique. Of a uh, of a um, feather in your cap that it is to be able to have shot that photo. Well, and uh, you know, I as you said earlier, maybe the stars were all aligned or whatever. And I I certainly had at the time had no no inkling. Uh, and this you know, is I, I had been in the bureau less than five years. And and this is, uh, we should let people know this is a group. This for people that might not understand the Detroit mob family. This isn't like the Gottis or the Capones, um, where they're out and about, uh, you know, almost, um, uh, you know, where you're almost like courting the media or you're doing things that you want to get media coverage. This is a group that shuns the media, wants to not be photographed. They don't want to end up on the front page of newspapers. So they do everything very covertly, very stealthily. So that, that makes the accomplishment that, that you were able uh, to do even even more impressive, yeah. And 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 Jack Toko was the kind of guy. He was kind of the the businessman godfather, the businessman Don. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the way he was. Uh, maybe analogous to Michael Corleone. Yep. Um, and I I had no idea what what was occurring. Uh, we didn't find out until later. But I, I was fortunate to get this this photo, which is under the circumstances is pretty good. And uh, by that time, after we had gone through the woods and everything, we had the plane up finally, and uh, the plane calls down. And I, I don't I, to this day I don't know whether uh, they were right or not, but they said something about, "Hey, it looks like they're letting the dogs out and uh, release the hounds." <laughs> yeah. So. And I don't think it had anything to do with us. And I, I don't even know if they were just playing with the dogs or what. But uh, at any rate, uh, we thought that discretion was a better part of valor. And we uh, decided we might go back out of the woods and, and take off. And we did. Um, uh, I didn't know until later how well the photograph would turn out. Because like I say, it was it was filmed. And you had to wait to get it developed. And uh, um, it was... A, it was uh, we were shooting with color then. For years, we just had black and white. And uh, later, obviously, the photo did turn out. We weren't sure, and uh, for a long time, uh, whether we were going to get censored for having uh, gone on to private property to take the picture. There was people that thought it was a good idea and some that didn't. And uh, or whether we'd get a letter of commendation. Actually, we got neither. <laughs> It, and that photo sat in the file for a and long until time. Until the 90s when game tax dropped. Exactly. So yeah, let's, let's, let's try to draw a line between some of the stuff we just talked about and Hoffa. So uh, we mentioned Jimmy Quasarano, who was Jack Topo's uh, consigliere. Jimmy Quasarano and the Corrados and another guy by the name of uh, Peter Vitale, who I, was also present, um, owned Central Sanitation in Hamtramck. Correct. And it's a place that a lot of people think that Hoffa could have been taken, the Hoffa's body could have been taken and disposed of there. 
uh, I believe on August 3rd, which would have been three or four days after Hoffa disappeared, um, federal surveillance team caught Jimmy Quasarano and Pete Vitale traveling from Detroit to New York City, where they met with a group of very high-ranking New York mobsters on the quote-unquote commission, the board of directors for the mafia um, in Manhattan. And then about eight months later, Central Sanitation burns down in an arson fire. Um, when you mentioned earlier in the interview that you thought Hoffa's body had been incinerated or uh, disposed of very quickly thereafter, does that Central sanitation theory play into the, the. It does to me, and it does to a, it, it. It does to a lot of people. And again, uh, when you're doing inve criminal investigations, uh, you uh, certainly are skeptical about coincidences. And uh, that arson fire at that place, where there may have may may or may not have been anything evidentiary, but they wouldn't know, and we wouldn't know. Uh, until we actually did a search, so um, the fact that it did burn down and that it was uh, it was owned and controlled by people in the by, family by Jimmy Q, the Vitalis, and the Corrado. So yeah, and uh, I should mention too that the game farm was owned by two guys, the Ruggiero brothers. brothers, who had been close to Jack, or their father had been very close to Jack Toko's father, and in fact, when they got kind of called on the carpet for this. Uh, Godfather inauguration, their, I don't want to say alibi, but their excuse was uh, one of them was dying, one of the Ruggiero brothers was dying, and that everyone was just coming there to pay respects to him, and that Jack Toko was only there because of Jack Toko's relationship with their deceased dad. Yeah. Uh, which was... <laughs> which, of course, we had source information to the yeah. contrary, that that was the day that, that Jack Toko took over the family. And it was actually a, a, a demotion for, for Zarelli. For Tony Zarelli, which will play a role in it. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. So Tony Zarelli and Jack Toko had been the mafia princes. Their dads had founded the family. They had been brother-in-laws, first cousins, best friends. And then when the family was moving to the second generation uh, in the 70s, when the old men were dying... Tony Zerilli was supposed to get the job, but he got caught stealing $6 million from Las Vegas, uh, the Frontier Casino, had to go to prison, and the powers that be decided to demote him while he was away as the heir apparent, give the job to Jack Toko, and it, it caused a, uh, a boiling tension, it caused boiling tensions between the former best friends, Tony, or sorry, Tony Zarelli and Jack Toko, uh, even though Jack made Tony his underboss, you had brewing tensions under the surface there for 20 plus years. Eventually, they all get indicted in Operation Game Tax in 1996, the biggest um, takedown of the Detroit mob ever. Zerilli and Toko both have to go to jail. Toko then demotes Zerilli because he blames them for all of this. Zerilli comes out of prison, and within a couple of years, he runs to the FBI and tells them, go to um, Oakland Township and go to Jack Toko's old farm, and that's where Hoffa's buried. What was your take when you heard that back in 2012 or 13? I thought uh, it was Zerilli's effort to to uh, sell a book and, and a last uh, departing shot at, uh, at Toko because uh, I don't believe the mob would bury Hoffa anywhere. On the boss's property? Yeah. I mean, that, that's it's counter, well, counter, counterintuitive. That and if if you were to bury him there, which I don't think they ever would, but if you were to bury him there, uh, and then you ultimately sold the property, which I think is the case with that farm, you wouldn't leave the body there. And uh, so, at any rate, I I don't put much stock in that. Does, I think I think it was just something that that really did. Uh, uh, you know, he was trying to, uh, uh, you know, 
like I say, maybe sell a book and um, he died and get some promotion. I and, spent some time with him at the end of his life. He died insisting that the body was there, that the feds dug in the wrong place. I believe that he believed that the body was there. But I also think, and I want to get your take on this, that it speaks to how close to the vest this conspiracy was kept by the people that did it and that perpetrated it. That someone like Tony Zerilli, who in theory should have been able to know what was going on. He was in jail, so he wasn't on the scene when it happened. But when he came out of jail, because he was so prominent and because he was one of the people that empowered Jimmy Hoffa, he had a right to know what happened. I think it 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 speaks to a they, they didn't trust Tony Zerilli even back then that Tony Jacqueline, Jack Toko, and some other people got together and said, we're going to have to tell Tony Z something, and we're going to lie to him for the possibility that sometime down the line, he, he gets loose lips. Uh, and, I, and the fact that they weren't willing to tell someone as high up as Zerilli tells me how guarded this secret of who was involved in the conspiracy was. I, 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 I totally agree with the fact that they kept it very closed and very tight. Um, uh, now, whether or not they told Zerilli that or whether or not Zerilli believed that, um, you know, obviously I, I can't no, say. I, I, and, yeah. and you had you I spent had, time with him and, and I, I believe that he, he wasn't trying to con anybody. Yeah. And that may be the case. What I would say, though, is that, and, uh, I, you know, I talk about this in the book, is that, you know, there's an old uh, aphorism in the law that is you without the corpus delecti, the body, it's almost impossible to prove a murder. And, uh, uh, and they knew that. And, uh, and so they destroyed that body. They didn't, they didn't bury it. I don't think they transported it to New Jersey. They, they destroyed it as quickly as possible. And knowing that, the, and as close as they kept it, there was just a, a small group of people that, that knew what happened, uh, specifically what happened. We all know generally what happened, but, uh, and uh, it proved to be, they proved to be right. That I, aphorism proved to be true. I, I believe, and I want to get your take on this too, that there was a conscious effort, specifically by the Giacalone brothers, to put out a disinformation campaign, to talk about the conspiracy quite a bit, but in public, but don't talk about it. the real details. Don't talk about what really happened. Try to fill the ether with all these fake stories. Um, and that's why 50 years later, everybody and their brother comes out of the woodwork claiming that they know where Hoffa's body is when the people that are telling you this could have never known it. And the people that they're saying they got it from could have never known it. And I, I, I think that that's certainly a, a, a fair, uh, certainly a, a, a plausible uh, possibility. And that I, brings us... I can't speak to it as a fact, but right. I certainly can say that it makes sense. So that brings us to New Jersey. You mentioned New Jersey. Uh, the most recent big piece of Hoffa, I'm going to say evidence... Um, to, I'm going to put quote mark, uh, quotation marks uh, 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 by evidence, uh, to come forward and get a lot of national publicity was um, last couple of years, 2021, 2022, uh, the FBI in New Jersey, the FBI in Detroit identified a spot underneath the Pulaski Skyway in New Jersey um, where a former member of the Genovese crew in New Jersey that was under um, the leadership of Tony Provenzano, one of Tony Provenzano's guys that had a old trash dump. Um, one of his sons and one of his partner's sons uh, came forward along with uh, Dan Moldea, the, the um, you know, I call him the godfather of Hoffa Research, and he, it all kind of begins and ends with him in terms of telling this story. Um, they took the FBI to this. Now it's like a, a, a nature preserve um, run by the state. But back in the 70s, it was a trash dump. And I know the feds searched that trash dump 
right early on in the investigation. Didn't find anything. They went back in 2022 based on that tip. A lot of publicity on that tip. And they didn't find anything. No. What, and they what, used, what's your take on it? Yeah. Well, my take again is that I believe the body was destroyed. And uh, so the I, notion that they could have taken the body <clears throat> cross country is. Well, they Somewhat ludicrous. They certainly could have, but why? Yeah, why would you do that? And, you know, Provisano, obviously, uh, I think he was coming to uh, to Michigan at that time for a, for, wedding. For a wedding. And, uh, uh, but at great pains to go nowhere near where any of the, uh, the things with Hoffa's disappearance took place. So uh, for him to, oh, why don't I have the body and let's ship it back to New Jersey? I've also heard that, you know, he wanted it close by because, you know, he hated Hoffa that much. He wanted it as a trophy yeah. or some type of bargaining uh, chip. I, I find that, uh, although it, it, it might sound good in a, in a novel, it, uh, uh, that's not the way I think these guys think. And I think it goes, in my opinion, again, to this East Coast narrative that Tony Provenzano, who, in my opinion, was as low as you could get on the totem pole of this particular conspiracy. He was a, he was an ornament. He was window dressing. He had no shot calling authority. So the idea that A, he would be allowed to do this, to take the body to New Jersey, even if he wanted to, I believe that Tony Giacalone and Jack Tocco and probably his own boss in New York, Tony Salerno or, or, or the Chin Gigante or, or the, the boss of the Genovese would have said, you're crazy. Yeah. And I would agree with that. That's not the kind of, that's not the way these guys operate, in my estimation. And um, I don't think that that happened. And, uh, you know, we're, we're stuck. If you, get, if you get a tip that, for example, if it comes from Zerilli or if it comes from somebody else, uh, with a certain amount of credibility and everything, you know, we have to follow up on it. Um, I, I think it's getting to the point now where uh, that's not going to happen. It certainly doesn't happen often. They used the best available technology, ground penetrating radar and stuff like that. But, you know, at this stage of the game, I just, uh, first of all, I don't think there's a body to find. But second of all, even if you're in that position, you've got to come to the realization that even if there had been a body, that it probably is not findable at this point. Certainly not if you made any efforts to, to get rid of it. But again, why transport it clear across the country to do that when you can destroy it and you have the, uh, uh, the wherewithal and the facilities to do it uh, nearby and quickly? Because I think time is of the essence in a situation like that. So you have a situation now where all but one suspect is dead. Uh, there's one remaining suspect in the case from the Hawfax memo. Gabe Bergulio, uh, whose brother, uh, Salvatore Sally Bugs Bergulio, was Tony Provenzano's hitman, his enforcer. Um, Gabe Bergulio, although made it into the Hoffax memo, and there were people that were putting him here uh, working for his brother or working for Provenzano in this conspiracy. He, he's never been implicated in any acts of violence outside of Hoffa, um, was not known as a big mob guy. or His brother was. Um, and Bergoglio recently did an interview with Fox News, um, obviously denied it. Um, did you have any any take on you know the last remaining suspect? I personally don't believe Gabe Bergoglio knows anything of substance. Um, was probably not involved in any meaningful way in this case. Um, but I'm interested in your take on. It. Yeah, I think uh, I I suspect uh, that your uh, theory, uh, and it probably is a little bit more than a theory, is that you know Provisano plays a part in this conspiracy in the sense that that was ostensibly the reason for the meeting. But having said that, I don't think beyond that, I don't think he played any part. I think the Detroit family was given the ticket and uh, they did it and uh, they did it the way they wanted to do it with their people. 
and disposed of the body, like I say, as quickly as possible. They weren't about to ship the body back to New Jersey or, you know, uh, it's just that's, you know, let's just get rid of the body and we'll keep it closed uh, down as far as the number of people involved. And uh, as long as we keep our mouths shut without a body, we're fine. So uh, there are two closing points I want to make, um, and then I want to promote your your book and uh, give people just a, a, another smidgen of your background. Um, so I think they pulled off the perfect murder. I mean, the fact that we're still talking about this 50 years later, the fact that there's no body to be found, the fact that the mythology is so widespread, I, I can't tell you... Now that I've been paying attention since I've been doing this, I can't tell you the amount of references, the, Hoff, the Jimmy Hoffa murder references that make it into the most random pieces of uh, you know, content. I mean, I was watching Ace Ventura the other day uh, with my little nephew, and you know, the, Jim character, the Jim Carrey character makes a joke about the Jimmy Hoffa murder in Ace Ventura. Um, so it, it's, it, it's so um, ubiquitous. But in some ways, isn't this the antithesis of what the Detroit mob wanted? I mean, yes, they wanted to get rid of the body, get rid of Hoffa, and go about their business. But they didn't want, for a family that likes to thrive in the shadows, they don't want every year, every two years, another story on the news about digging for Hoffa. So it was like the gift and the curse. I, and I, I'm going to tell you one thing that I heard from someone, and I want to get your take on it, and then the question I just asked. Someone that was very close to this conspiracy, potentially involved in this conspiracy, uh, I talked to before he died. And he said, if we had to do it all over again, we would have left Hoffa lying in the parking lot at the Red Fox or, lot, or lying in Telegraph Road. That getting rid of the body the way they did actually caused more problems than, than uh, it was worth. Well, I, and you don't know what. If if that had been the scenario, if that had happened, if they had you know gunned him down like Anastasia in the barber shop or whatever, but um, or left him on the curb. Uh, but that being said, we're not talking about Anastasia, and we're not talking about some of the. I mean, it's still brought up if you if you know mob history, but uh, uh, the very fact that we never found the body leads to all kinds of speculation. And so uh, I think you're right. It plays into this conspiracy mentality and a lot of other things. Uh, and so they might have been better off. And clearly, over the years, what transpired. Uh, the Bureau, uh, I think to our credit, uh, we have a long attention span. And we just kept hammering away. We didn't, we didn't solve the murder, but we cleaned up the Teamsters. We uh, convicted the Detroit family yeah. on a RICO statute. Well, well, we should, let me just interrupt you for a second and, sure. and, then, and then push it back to you. But every, cons every suspected conspirator ended up having to go to prison, not for the Hoffa case, but Tony, Pro Tony Provenzano died in prison. Um, got locked up shortly thereafter. Tony Giacalone wasn't at Jack Tocco's inauguration because he had to go to prison. Um, Jack Tocco eventually has to go to prison. Tony Israeli eventually has to go to prison. Uh, so most of the people that were involved in it did have to pay some type of price. It just wasn't for Hoffa. Correct. And that's what I'm saying. That the family... Uh, they protected that connection to the Teamsters Pension Fund uh, in the short term. But in the long term, uh, I think it caused us to focus on the Detroit family, maybe more than we would have. We were pretty focused, but maybe more than we would have. But certainly on the Teamster uh, Mafia connection. Uh, it caused us to actually put the Teamsters Union under federal uh, trusteeship for a period of time. Uh, Frank Fitzsimmons uh, was pushed out of his leadership role. 
His son was put in jail for making payoffs to trucking companies. I actually worked some surveillance on that case. And um, interestingly or ironically, uh, the Teamsters Union was cleaned up, relatively speaking. And uh, who did it? And Hoffa's son. Right. That, to, to me, that could be the most ja James Hoffa ended most intriguing up footnote. Yeah. Is that after all that was said and done, 20 years later, uh, James P. Hoffa comes into power in 96 and, and cleanses the Teamsters Union of, of organized crime, you know, for all intents and purposes. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, the labor movement being what it is, it's uh, like anything else, it's going to have some elements of corruption. But for all, all uh, you know, like I say, relatively speaking, clean union now. And Hoffa's son ends up being in charge of the union. Uh, Richard Fitzsimmons, uh, Frank Fitzsimmons' son, ends up in jail. Frank's no longer... There's in, some poetic justice there. Somehow. There is. And, uh, and the Detroit family in 1998 gets convicted uh, uh, under they the all, RICO statute. It, it was all but one person got convicted. Tony mm -hmm. Toko was acquitted, but everyone else got convicted. <clears throat> it was uh, a landmark case. Jack Toko was someone that uh, really valued being able to say, you've never convicted me of anything, and I'm going to sue you if you call me a mob boss. And that all got you know, sledgehammered uh, out of the picture when he had to go serve some time. But it was somewhat suspicious uh, sentencing. You only had to go do about 18 months. Uh, so maybe he, he ended up having the last laugh. I don't know. But I know that Jack Toko, in his final years, bristled any time that his picture got put up on the news because of someone talking about Jimmy Hoffa. Um, and he's somebody that was kind of forgotten about after the 90, uh, 90s game tax case. Um, uh, I started to write about him in, in, in the late 2000s, but in terms of the mainstream media, he had been forgotten about. And then Zerilli comes back, or Zerilli brings him back into the media spotlight back in 2012 and 13. He died in 14, but I know this last couple of years he was not happy with being fodder again for the media because of his first cousin who he blamed for the whole thing to start. Yeah. And, uh, and if you go to Jack Toko's Wikipedia page, there's that photo of the game farm. Yep. And one of the things that made it uh, so relevant in that 1998 trial when it finally saw the light of day, that photo. Uh, was the fact that uh, a few weeks prior to the uh, RICO trial, Vito Jackalone had pled guilty in open court and admitted that he had been a member of the Detroit family of the La Cosa Nostra. And uh, that's very, for some people, that's very rare to get a guy like that to go on the record. And it's called an allocution. Um, and surprised us, quite frankly. Uh, surprised the prosecution. And uh, Well, for Billy, it was the difference of going to do 12 years in prison or going to do six years in prison. And, uh, well, I, and he was 78 at the time. And, uh, or 76. So when we introduced the picture a few weeks later in the trial, uh, who's in the picture? Jack Toko and Vito Giacalone and... Tony Corrado, but Vito had just admitted that he was a member of the family. Uh, and of course, we're testifying to the only people at that function were people that we knew to be, what I said in court was, uh, known members of the Detroit family of the La Cosa Nostra, until finally the defense decided it might be a good idea to object to that uh, after I'd gotten it in about four or five times. But anyway. So let's close with, where was he killed? Um, I know there are a couple theories out there. Uh, I want to throw two at you and get your take at, uh, on them. Um, first theory is that he was murdered at Carlo Licata's house. Carlo Licata was a brother-in-law to the Tocos. He was also a mafia prince. His dad was the godfather of Los Angeles, married in the Detroit family. He was at the uh, famous game... Um, Timberland Game Ranch for the inauguration that you that you photographed has a or had a house on Telegraph and Long Lake um, was about a two or three minute drive going north from the Marcus Red Fox. It was a uh, a house and a location that 
The Jackalonis had met Hoffa at four sit-downs in the past, so he would have been comfortable going there. Um, and then Lakata himself ended up dead at that residence on the six-year anniversary at, on July 30th, 1981. Uh, it was ruled a suicide. There's some questions about whether or not it really was. But to me, the fact that he ended up dead on the anniversary kind of, to me, kind of confirmed that he was most likely killed at Lakata's house. But I don't know. What's your take? Well, I mean, again, <laughs> without it's all speculation, without yeah, and without divulging and, I, and I, compromising I, the the, the uh, active investigation. Well, and uh, to the sense that it's still active, yeah. because I, I can't I can't pretend that it's as active as it as it right. was. It's uh, it, you know, eventually there won't be anything left to do other than just say you know we're still open. Uh, but, you know, I can't, and it would be pure speculation mm -hmm. on my part. It makes sense. And like I say, uh, we always look skeptically at coincidences and the fact that, yeah, the anniversary of his death being on the anniversary of Hoffa's death or what we assume was Hoffa's death, uh, you know, that leads you to think that. But uh, that could be nothing more than the fact that maybe he, uh, he was aware and, and, uh, and uh, and had some involvement. It didn't necessarily have to be at that place. And I know there are several other locations that people speculate. Well, the other uh, location I would um, ask you to comment on is uh, Lenny Schultz's house, which would have been about a two or three minute um, drive in the other direction from the Marcus Red Fox. He lived at 13 in Franklin. Uh, Lenny Schultz was the owner of the South Athletic Club, someone that was close to Jimmy Hoffa. Um, I don't know how many times, if any, Jimmy Hoffa had ever visited Lenny Schultz at his house. So I don't know if he would have felt comfortable going over there. I do know that a year before Hoffa disappeared, I believe, and I know a lot of investigators believe, that Harvey Leach, who was the furniture store mogul who got into bed with the Jackalonis, um, ended up being killed at that residence and stuffed in the trunk of his car on the uh, on his wedding day, they found him at, at, at 13 in Southfield at the uh, Congress building, um, which is right next to a Target right now. But uh, the the theory being that if they felt comfortable killing someone at Schultz's house a year before that, and Schultz was a part of the meeting that. Hoffa was supposed to go to that day that they could have, in theory, killed him at Schultz's house. Well, again, uh, there's it has some plausibility. Uh, and again, it would be, on my part, pure speculation. Uh, well, just wanted to get your yeah. take on it. I, I mean, uh, those both those theories are plausible. And there's probably maybe one or two more out there that are plausible. Uh, you know, uh, it raises questions in both cases. You know, do you do you want to have the murder of a prominent person take place in your house, or would it be better to find some place? You know, and, uh, and for Lenny Schultz, I know that the uh, the speculation that Harvey Leach was killed there caused him a lot of headaches. Uh, I know he he made he, he made um, accusations that in the months after he thought that the FBI staged a break in. Uh, his house had been burglarized, and he he was pointing the finger at the FBI, saying that they snuck into my house to try to find out evidence of something that never happened. So it was something that I know if if the Schultz, if if Schultz had been bothered by the attention that he got from Leach, he'd probably be a lot more hesitant to say, "Hey guys, come in and bring Jimmy Hoffa in here and, and whack him at my house again." Yeah, and again, that's that's why I'm yeah. Uh, you know, that that would be a question I would ask myself. And, you know, uh, but you have to find you also have to find a, a location that would be safe that the Jimmy wouldn't uh, wouldn't have balked at because, you know, he uh, Hoffa obviously was not stupid. And he also knew that, you know, that this could cut both ways. And that's why it had they had to have developed a scenario where he would feel at least marginally comfortable, uh, or they he couldn't have pulled it, it off. He never got his gun from his car. He had a gun in his car in the parking lot of uh, of the Red Fox, but did not bring the gun with him, which 
might just be protocol. I mean, for people that don't know, mob sit downs, the typical etiquette is nobody brings weapons. Uh, Unless you've got them secreted above a toilet <laughs> in the bathroom. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, where do we go from here? Where does, the, where does the Bureau go from here? 48 years. We're heading towards the 50 year anniversary in two years. M most, if not every person that you could arrest um, is, is dead. In theory, there could be a body. Do we keep looking for it? Do we shut the thing down at the 50-year anniversary mark? You know, I can't say whether they would. I mean, in all, for all practical purposes, it is shut down. I mean, if you've got nothing to do, uh, and, and they don't, to, at least as much as I know about it, uh, being retired. But um, there wasn't even much going on, you know, when I left the Bureau. But... Uh, if something was brought to the Bureau's attention that, uh, you know, uh, would then we would obviously actively investigate it. But short of that, I don't think anything's going to happen. Uh, Jack Toko died in 14. Tony Powell died in 19. Tony Pro died in like 1988 or 89. The Jackalone brothers are gone. Billy uh, Jackalone died in 2012. Um, yeah. Sally Bugs Bergulio uh, was killed in the gangland style hit in 1978. There was speculation that he might have been trying to leverage his knowledge. Well, keep in for, mind, you know, I was case that he was uh, another murder case he was facing, which is the the case that put Tony Provenzano in prison for the rest of his life. Yeah, which was I, another union related hit. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, I was a, a brand new agent, uh, 26 years old in, on July 30th. And I'm now 74 years old. So that kind of gives you a feel for what, what, if anything, we can do with the case other than uh, do what we're doing right now. Well, uh, Greg, you, uh, you wrote a book. And I, I did. want everyone to know about it. it it's uh, a fascinating tale of your career. And it talks about Jimmy Hoffa. It talks about the, the game, uh, the Timberland Game Ranch photo and much more. Tell, tell the audience. Well, more. I mean, I should, I should preface this with this. Nothing in my career did I do by myself. And this isn't really about my career as much as it is about cases that I, I believe I was fortunate to be involved in. Starting with the first chapter, which is about my, the fact that I got to Detroit and Jimmy Hoffa gets, uh, uh, disappears. And so I was involved in that case. Uh, subsequently to that, I was involved in uh, the Veterans Hospital of Poisoning case, the, uh, the Stemple kidnapping case, um, the Unabomber, uh, the Oklahoma City bombing are all in there. Uh, I developed a very close relationship with Bo Schembechler. And because of that relationship, I was heavily involved in uh, a very successful, I think, actually the first uh, steroid uh, undercover case where we targeted the, uh, uh, the steroid black market. And this, was the, this was before um, the Barry Bonds and oh, this yeah. was like the first era in the late 80s. With like well, it, it, started, it actually started with a meeting with Bo uh, when he called me over. And uh, ultimately, uh, you know, we did... Uh, it, it started as just a, a small local undercover case, became an international case, did a lot of work with the Mounties in Canada, some stuff in, in Mexico, and then all across the United States. And we ultimately uh, uh, convicted the uh, dealer who had uh, dealt Jose Canseco and, uh, and Mark McGuire. And we, we warned Major League Baseball in 1994, hey, you got a big problem. But, you know, they were in the midst of a labor issue and... Uh, uh, the, it was something the players at that point didn't want to be tested. Uh, later they did, but uh, at that point they didn't, and this was not something they wanted to deal with. So they they basically ignored it, and uh, we saw what happened. Well, yeah. tell everyone the title and where they can find it. Well, you can, uh, you can get it at at least in Michigan. You can get it at local bookstores, but it's uh, it's uh, FBI case files, Michigan. Uh, Tales, Tales of the G Man. Love it. And uh, uh, it's available on, uh, uh, it's Arcadia, the History Press, and it's available in a lot of bookstores, but also on Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, Target. Uh, so, uh, well, Greg, you, you've done it all. 
you, you've said it all. You're you're a living legend. For <laughs> I don't real. Know about I mean, that. I you know, for people like you, you you lived a movie script, uh the highest level of, of law enforcement, you know, fighting the bad guys, the baddest of the bad guys, uh, involved in all these iconic cases. Thank you so much for coming and joining me here on the crime beat and uh letting Metro Detroit all uh know about your work on the Hoffa case and where the Hoffa case stands now, where where we came from from 1975 up to up to now, what your uh, analysis and insight is on this incredibly um, compelling, riveting true crime mystery that uh, it's always evergreen. Hoffa, the Hoffa subject is always evergreen, and it and it seems to be the case that will never die, even though Hoffa himself has probably been dead for 48 years. So, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thank Scott. you, Greg.